Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? So, normally I spend my time consulting professional companies on how to apply technology and innovate with it, but also on how to humanize technology. But this job of mine has taken me to all kinds of places. It's taken me to the poorest parts of the world, to the most fanciest corporate boardroom. And this experience has taught me a lot. And today I want to share with you some really unusual stories about how the poorest and the most difficult situations, people try to improvise and build on technology to make it useful and relevant for themselves. So I'm going to talk about frugal digital in the sense that frugality is an alternate vision of creating a digitally inclusive world. Today there's a huge gap between what's available as technology and who can access them. And the poorest of the poorest people find amazing ways to bridge this gap themselves. What can we learn from that? What processes can we inspire from that? And how can we apply that in creating the next generation product for the two thirds of the world which do not have the fastest and the fanciest digital access? So frugality as a concept exists in every poor society. It's all about optimizing. It's all about upcycling. It's all about improvisation. It's about being as efficient as possible in terms of economics, but also in terms of what's available and how to keep on using it in the best possible way. So this spirit is not there in the digital world today because silicon technology today is mostly about a culture of excess. Everyone is talking about the fastest and the best and the dazzling and the most shiny black box you can ever buy. But this is a different kind of world. I'm going to talk about the story of a new age entrepreneur. So this story stems from one of our research that we did in India. This is Mr. Satish Rai. He's the most unusual character I ever met in my travels. Um, he's an entrepreneur of a different kind because he's the next generation digital entrepreneur in one of the poorest parts of Mumbai. He runs a small scale enterprise. He runs a small shop that looks like any other shop from outside, except that if you look very closely, you'll discover something interesting. He has a digital payment service in a shop. He makes his, most of his money by selling subscriptions and talk time on cellular networks. But in the back side of his store, there's this little corner where he's got a team of people who can fix almost any kind of mobile phone. And they very proudly, they say, they can fix it at the chip level. That is, they can make changes to your phone, they can fix broken phones, they can flash new software on it. It's a whole new universe in there. They have amazing know-how and methodologies around this. There's a huge culture of reverse engineering and sort of discovering how to fix things. And this knowledge is deeply encoded in the informal education sector of these kinds of poor societies. This is how they make a living. The best part about this is that they also train other people. We talked about school dropouts earlier today, and they actually take up school dropouts and they train them to provide them a new form of livelihood. And they do actually earn pretty decent wages, almost comparable or even better than university trained students. Then there is the technology ecosystems around it. This is a different kind of environment. It's not about precision engineering. It's not about fantastic fabrication. It's not about the fastest and best manufacturing setup. It's about the craft of technology, which is very different from the science of technology. In most developing nations, there are lots of traditional crafts which are still existing. And these kinds of traditional crafts are interlinking with a new kind of craft. It's all about the crafting of technology. People know how to create custom hardware for you. They know how to build an amplifier for your car or your apartment. They know how to fix things. They know how to build you a, a particular kind of computer. They, they know so much about you as a person and they try to tailor make the technology for you. And this is what crafting technology is about. And then the ecosystem has a support of low cost tools and supplies for making these things happen. On the sidewalks of many of these cities, 
from Africa to India to Southeast Asia, you will find numerous shops selling all kinds of tools and supplies for this kind of an industry. And then there are small retailers who actually help in creating and selling these kinds of technologies, both in the traditional centrally manufactured systems, but also in the informal sector where you can get specific things made for your own purpose. Then there's a whole culture of recycling, but in a very different sense, it's about salvaging what's available. There's a street scene where you can buy second-hand computer parts uh, to basically build up any kind of computer for almost one-tenth the price that you can buy in a retail store. You get low-cost substitutes for the most expensive parts. You can, there's an entire industry manufacturing these kinds of substitutes. So what can we do with all this? This is an amazing example of how a solar panel is made from waste or broken solar panels. They're repatched and built up this thing and it sells for about one-fourth or one-fifth the price of what you would end up paying for a properly manufactured solar panel. It has its issues, it's not issue free, but at the same time, it does the job and even if it's broken, you can get it fixed. That's the best part about this. I found amazing precision motors um, which are so expensive to buy online today and you can buy them in the streets for almost nothing. So what does it give us? It gives us a culture of fix it yourself, which is very prevalent. It gives us cheap fabrication. It provides us amazing capabilities in the sense that a huge amount of processing power for very little cost, thanks to the way most chip technology is progressing. And there's an ecosystem of inexpensive peripherals because of the way print uh, media works and the way printer manufacturers provide peripherals. Um, you get inexpensive parts from salvaged printers and plotters and whatnot. So what can this give us is, is an interesting take. And how can we apply this is the bigger question. So this is what I call as the silicon cottage industry. It's a different kind of industry which is all about doing it in a very small scale in a decentralized fashion but highly customized and tailor-made to individual requirements. So this is another story of an inexpensive television. Um, so what happens when a large bank throws away huge amounts of old monitors that they moved on to LCD technology? So this is what happens. You find salvaged computer monitors that have been taken and refurbished with television tuners to make them into televisions. So they've converted monitors from banks to televisions that can be sold through a system of kits that is locally manufactured and distributed to rural, rural markets. And so you can buy almost a color television for 30 euros, including warranty, because it can be fixed so easily almost anywhere. So inspired from all this, we sort of decided that we have to find ways to apply this kind of processes and methods into new kinds of products and new ways of thinking around creating digital access. So this is a project which we call as a lunchbox. It's a multimedia learning platform that we created for schools that do not have the means to buy access to digital information. Schools are social settings. When we went and visited the poorest of the poorest places in the remote corners, we discovered unusual schools run by just one teacher or we'll be lucky if they have a room to study in. And the most amazing thing about these schools is that it's a fantastic social settings. The children get together, they spend time there, they engage themselves, they learn, and they sort of participate together in a class. And the teacher is a very important role to play in this. The teacher is the facilitator. But today, the teacher does not have the means or the tools to give the children this access to this huge digital world. So we said, how can we provide and make the teachers into facilitators to a digital world? And so we took upon this challenge. And we said, we have to find ways to empower the teacher. We have to make the teacher a digital gateway. And we have to design inexpensive multimedia platform for them to use. Today, alternate visions about a digital inclusion usually talks about a little laptop-like device or a pad of some kind. All of this is interesting, but it makes the class unsocial. It gets every student to stare at a screen and hope to participate in the class. It does not even provide the teacher the right platform because the teacher needs to get engaged with the children as much as providing tools and means and access. I don't know how many of you teach, but if you try teaching to a 
classroom full of students with laptops staring at their little screens is really disheartening. So if you want to teach, you want to have good participation. And how do you create a tool for is a big question. So see, we said, let's see what's available first. So we went and scavenged around in the local markets to find what's available. So we found this amazing little Pico projector mobile phones. These mobile phones which have a really tiny little projector that can project a little bit of distance and with a little bit of luminosity. We, want, we went and found a flashlight with rechargeable batteries. We found a lunchbox to put everything into. We found little speakers that could amplify the sound. We put all this together and we sort of created this uh, mishmash of things. We basically borrowed different pieces of technology from whatever was available in the local area. So the projector mobile phone was a fantastic multimedia platform. It was connected, it has GPRS connection, it can connect to the internet. The flashlight gave us really bright LEDs and a rechargeable battery pack. The lunchbox was a nice little package. And the speakers gave enough sound level for us to make a little tool. So we went to one of those industries, which is all about fixing and repairing and all about tinkering. And we put together this team that took the skills of these kinds of people along with some of my colleagues. And we created this amazing little intervention. Some people call it a hack, where we took the flashlight and the LED and we hooked it to the mobile phone. We sort of repurposed the whole thing uh, so that it produced enough luminosity. It can be used in a reasonably lit classroom. Uh, we salvaged some of the parts from here and there. We put it together. We packaged it all into a nice little box. We call it a hardware mashup. And it's totally improvised. It's 100% improvised. So we made this little box as the first test to see how effective this is. Can it really solve some of the issues? Can the teachers really get empowered with this? So we took it and we took it to classrooms. We took it to some really unusual settings where you don't even have electricity. Um, and this gave us some very valuable learnings. Of course, there were lots of issues with it. It was not so simple to solve these. We realized that uh, the batteries were draining really quick. The brightness wasn't enough sometimes. Um, the sound level had to be pretty high because the children really, once they get so excited, they want to scream and they want to jump in into the lesson. And the teacher also needed some training and they needed some hand-holding to make this happen. So we said, okay, from these learnings, we'll make the next iteration, and that's what we made. We made a next box and we tied it out again in some schools. And the next iteration after that, we made a slightly bigger box because we realized that size was not such a big constraint actually because the teachers were actually willing to carry these boxes if they provided their real genuine value. And we decided that it probably needs a little bit of solar power backup so that the batteries don't drain so fast. We also discovered that car batteries and truck batteries were widely available in these places because that's how most people run their televisions. And so we provided provisions in this box to connect up to batteries from cars and trucks. Uh, we also decided that this whole curriculum, if you design a new curriculum, needs to be built on existing curriculum. So we don't need to create everything from scratch. So we created a new format in which we could collate information and a lot of open source material and videos and class instructions and science experiments and whatnot and animations from the World Wide Web. And we created a little format on a USB key. And so this whole box runs off one single USB key. And the teacher, all that the teacher needs is once in a while to get hold of one of these USB keys and copy the information onto it. Or even if an organization wants to do something about it, they can post by regular mail these USB keys. And then they plug into this box and the teacher can sort of kickstart a lesson based on their requirements and not based on how the curriculum dictates what needs to be there. So we created this little box. Um, and I have a little demo down there for people who are interested. I can show later on how it works and what are the features in it and how it actually can be built uh, from whatever is readily available. And this box, our estimate is that it costs about close to 70 to 80 euros. Um, compare that with a computer and an LCD projector and a whole bunch of other things including steady power supply. This is a real bargain. And cost? 
is a fundamental starting point in these kinds of economies. We start with cost, we need to create value, and then eventually the product picks up by itself. The best part about this is that it's locally serviceable. So that means that if it breaks down or if it has some issues, it can be taken to one of these mobile repair shops somewhere nearby, and it can be fixed almost without any hitch. Because the technologies in there are mostly based on mobile technologies, and it's based on very simple fabrication techniques. All you need is a few tools and a little bit of knowledge on how to construct this thing and deconstruct it. So what can we do with this is a real question. So education is just one of the areas that we're addressing in the spirit of frugal digital. We think that this can be applied to all other kinds of sectors. We are right now working on testing these things out in the education context, but at the same time, we want to find ways of scaling this idea. So we're working with different collaborators on scaling it to about 37,000 schools in India right now. Um, but the best part is the same approach can be applied to other kinds of areas including low-cost medical diagnostics. You can do agricultural advisory. You can do soil and water testing. There are endless amounts of possibilities if the process around these things are tailor-made for the context and the situation and the economics of a certain place. So this is what all Frugal Digital is about. And you can find out more information about this if you want to online. Thank you.